happy Thursday. Um, and so, yeah, why don't we why don't we just go ahead and uh, jump right in? So uh, my name is Mark Thuin. I'm the director of the Master of Science program in information technology and management. And uh, we're going to spend the next hour or so answering your questions uh, about the program. Um, we're also going to provide some specific advice and recommendations for those that are are joining, right? They already know they're joining and they're planning to join in the fall of 22 or maybe the summer of 22. And so we're going to talk about uh, just the process for that and uh, the registration um, as well, uh, the registration process and some, some suggestions for taking courses. So I see a comment. Can everyone see me okay? Those are the yeah, links, I, I guess, I think right? Th they're referring to the links that I posted. Apparently, yes, they're Mark, saying thanks. they can't see them. I will post them again. They're not there. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, and so, so the, this this meeting, this webinar, this information session, right? It, it's designed to help you, and and so feel free to ask questions um, as we move forward. Uh, we have uh, a number of people that are here to help answer your questions, so I'm obviously able to help answer questions. And and uh, Donna, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? And and, uh, and obviously Donna can help answer questions as well. But yeah, Donna, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I'm Donna. I'm the program specialist for the MSITM program. Um, I've been with the program almost two years now. So the first group of students that joined when I started are now graduating great milestone to have. I know I probably talked to some of you via email. I'm always here to answer whatever questions you may have and help out. And I'm real good at pointing you to the specific web page you need to go to. <laughs> and just, just as an FYI, the search function on the web page is your friend. That's what I use all the time when people ask me questions I don't know. I just go search on our website and usually the answer will pop up. So it's great to see you all this morning and looking forward to getting to know you better. Yeah, and that is, that is a good point, Donna, so thank you for bringing that up. We we do try and keep our website up to date, as up to date as possible. And anytime, you know, we get a question or or have new information to share, we're going to make sure that it's on our website and, and that it's accessible. So in, in general, just like Donna said, if, if you go to our website, chances are you'll be able to answer your question um, directly from the website. So. One of the nice things about our, our monthly webinars is that you're able to get a variety of perspectives. Um, so we have some senior students uh, that are on the call with us. Uh, these senior students are members of the ITM Student Leadership Council. So Information Technology and Management, that's ITM, and, and they're part of our Student Leadership Council. And um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So I see uh, Ranjitha, you're on the call with us this morning. Fantastic. And and Ranjitha is just getting ready to graduate. I think you have, what, three more weeks left or two more weeks and then you're done. Oh, yes, Professor. Like this would be my last webinar, I guess, like before graduating. So um, I was here like before joining university and here I'm at the last webinar which I'm going to attend here at university. So it feels like a beautiful journey for now. It's been like two years and most of the time spent with COVID, but it was a lot of fun. Um, so if you have any questions, we are happy to help and ask any sort of question it might be. Uh, as Professor Dona said, yeah, first thing would be visiting website, but if still it doesn't answer, uh, you need perspective from a current student or professor. So feel free to reach out to us. We, uh, professor has listed all the ways you could reach out to us. Um, so wishing you all the best and good luck uh, for joining university. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, you're right. Two years ago, we we were, you know, COVID was was uh, front and center of a lot of activity and and uh, um, you know dictating and what we did and and uh, you know I'm happy to share and say with with everyone on the call, right? We're we're back to normal. Um, so so here at UTD, we are uh, in the classroom, in person, uh, face to face, every session, every day. Uh, campus has come back to life, and and so it, it's it's a great feeling, right? It, it's a very good feeling, and uh, it's good to see because I I know that that time was hard for everyone, a little bit hard for everyone. So it's good to get back to uh, back to normal. So um, 
Do we have anyone else from the SLC on the call this morning? Ranjith or Adana, do you see anyone else uh, in the list? I'm, I'm not seeing anyone just yet. It doesn't mean there isn't. Um, no, I'm not seeing yet. anybody right now, but they uh, may show up in a little bit. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. So, so um, I am going to try and start off with a um, with a survey question or a quick question for everyone on the call. So th this is just to get a feel uh, for um, when you're planning to join. Plan. So I'm, I'm creating a form, I'm creating a survey question really quickly here, and it's just going to be three options, summer, fall, and spring 23. And all right, it should be live uh, now, maybe thinking about it it is live right so i created a quick poll question can everybody see it yeah so go ahead and respond to that question so this is uh just when do you plan to join utd and and start your studies right and and so um there we go you know that updated all at once and and i'm expecting most on the call to be uh, fall of 2022, and so far that's the case. And I do see one hand up. So Ashish, I think it was Ashish. Let me go back here. Yeah, Ashish, do you want to go ahead and um, uh, ask a question? Ashish? Yeah, fourth option, fall of 23. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thinking about fall of 23 already. So maybe Ashish's hand was up um, uh, just on accident. So anyway, all right. So, so um, I, I do want to provide some specific advice uh, for those that um, are joining either fall of 22 or summer of 22 and um, have already been admitted, right? And and th this is this advice and, and uh, this process we're going to talk about applies to everyone uh, once you get admitted. So one thing that we do here at, at UTD, um, and, and this is, I, I think, different than many schools, is that we will let you register for classes um, after you've been admitted to the program and before you actually arrive uh, to campus, right? So our fall 22 students are able to register for classes now. And they have been able to register for classes uh, since uh, maybe the second week in April, right? Now, I, I'm, you know, the specific date, I think it's either the first or the second week in April. Yeah, okay. I, I believe registration started for everyone on the 4th of April. So there new income fourth students of April would have been in that week or the next week. Perfect, perfect. And, and, you know, we feel that this is a, a really nice benefit for everyone in, in that you're able to pick your courses and know what your courses are going to be prior to actually traveling to Dallas in, in August, right? So it kind of takes some of the uncertainty out of the, the, the equation, right? And, and it just kind of increases your overall comfort level because you, you know exactly what classes you've signed up for and, and you know, uh, when you're going to be taking them, what day of the week, and and who your instructor is, and and you can even, you know, get a copy of a prior year syllabus or a prior semester syllabus, and and see what it says, and and maybe kind of brush up on some of the topics all while you're, you know, um, preparing to start. And this is all before you've started the program as well. So again, it's a it's a real benefit, and um, if you've been admitted and uh, you haven't yet registered, you should try and register soon. That's my, that's some big advice uh, for everyone. And the way to register is, is through a system that we have called Orion. 
And so this is um, our URL here up at the top is utdallas.edu forward slash galaxy. And, and my screens in Orion look different than yours, right? So I, I can't go into it and, and show you what a student's uh, view looks like, but basically it's a, um, a software system that lets you browse all our courses and uh, register or sign up to take a specific course. Um, there are a set of tutorials that are available and Donna's I'm sure already posted these uh, in the um, in the chat window. But if you go to our website and go up to the advising homepage and then there's a, um, a section for new students and then I think if you click on graduate right you can see the um, the link there and then we have a uh, set of uh, checklists really and, and videos of steps after admission what you should do and these checklists are very very helpful you really want to go you know one at a time through this so accept your offer um, submit your official transcripts it's very important that you do that as soon as possible so um, we will if needed um, this isn't our, our uh, first choice but if needed we'll let you enroll in your first semester without an official transcript right um, but the second semester we absolutely won't let you enroll without a, an official transcript and and sometimes that can uh, hold things up a bit um, you know if you're interested in financial aid on campus housing right you see the links listed here uh, and then you'll have a, a couple of different student orientations to attend um, we have a department orientation uh, that I'm going to host along with Donna and some of our uh, some of our students who have just completed an internship. OK, so that'll be in August. You'll get more information about that. You'll also have if you're an international student, you're going to have an, a, um, an orientation focused uh, on, uh, you know, what it's like to be an international student and some of the rules uh, governing your F1 student visa. And that's a, again, a very important orientation to go to. It is mandatory. Uh, it's one of the orientations again that um, you know we uh, typically won't let you register for classes unless you've attended that orientation. Um, again, you may get a, a one time exemption, but you, you may not um, uh, be able to register in the second semester. And, and so that kind of brings me back to Orion, right? And, and this, um, our official system. And the, the university has a process uh, in place where they can and do put holds on accounts. And, and so what a hold is, is it uh, prevents someone from registering for classes, okay? So it basically locks the account and prevents someone from registering for additional classes. And the only way to register for additional classes is actually to uh, remove the hold. And to remove the hold, you have to perform whatever action is specified per the hold. OK, so if you're not able to register for classes because you have a hold, right, you want to click on the hold. Um, and find out exactly what your hold is because the hold can be for a variety of reasons. And um, once you find out what the hold is, then you need to resolve that hold in order to start registering for classes. OK, so, so that that's a um, just a, a really important tip I wanted to point out. And, and then, you know, once all your holds are removed, and this is true for all of our newly admitted fall 22 students, you are now able to register for classes. And, and um, that's what I wanted to talk about next. And Donna, do you have any any thoughts or comments to share about the holds? Because we we do get a lot of questions and, and there's some frustration that comes up sometimes about, you know, someone not being able to register because they have a hold. And, and um, yeah, so Donna, do you want to share something? Yeah, um, on the registration page from our advising office, I have posted the link to that. There is a video that shows you exactly how to go into Orion, go into Galaxy, and check and see what your holds are. Um, that is on the course registration page. It is, let's see, clear all academic holds. It's item number three on the page I'm going to post. And this is the process you will need to follow. You can email 
Professor Thuin and myself all day long, every day, neither one of us has the ability to remove your holds. So when you go into there, it will tell you what the hold is. It will also give you information on who to contact for the hold. That they're the only ones that could remove it. So once again, I said sending emails to everyone at the university will not assist in getting that hold. Sometimes you don't get an immediate response from that department. Um, keep in mind that we have how many students here? 20,000 students plus here on campus, and they're all they're dealing with the holds for all of them, not just you. So it might take a little while to get a response. Patience. I, I know it's hard sometimes to be patient, but that's your best option. But yeah, that item number three on the right course registration page from our advising office, there's a video that shows you step by step how to get your holds removed. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Donna. That's very helpful. And and so um, now that we've talked about the holds and the hold process, I wanted to talk about courses and coursework. OK, and and so there's a lot of flexibility in terms of uh the courses you take and the path you choose to move as you go through the program right the path you choose to take as you move through the program and and so um you can see our degree requirements by going to our website and our home page and looking at our curriculum and many of you have probably already you know examined this viewed this right so the program requires 12 three credit hour classes the classes are evenly split between core coursework and elective coursework. OK, so six core courses, six elective courses. Each course is three credit hours. Uh, the core courses are a mix of business foundation and IT foundation classes or business core or an IT core classes. Uh, you have three of each and then for your elective courses, uh, they can um, a minimum of four of the six have to be MIS courses. Uh, two of the six electives can be free electives, and a free elective can be any course in the School of Management. All right, just like the name implies. So it could be another MIS course, right? So of your elective courses, right? All 18 credit hours could be um, MIS courses, right? Uh, all six courses could be MIS courses, or you could have you know, four MIS and two free electives or, you know, five MIS and maybe one free elective, whatever the case might be. So all of our courses are three credit hours. So that's where, you know, you'll see the, sometimes you'll see credit hours listed as is the case on this page. So it's saying 18 credit hours of four courses, 18 credit hours of elective courses. Um, so you just divide that by three and, and that gives you the number of courses per four you know, core and elected. There's, a, you know, every seems like every rule has an exception. So there are just a couple of courses that aren't three credits, but for the most part, um, your courses are three credit hours each, right? And and the uh, the degree plan itself, the specifics, right, can be seen on, on the following day um, when you look at and drill down. And um, all right, and um, again, the, the courses, core courses are, are going to show up at the top. Uh, we have IT core, IT foundation, and then business core. The IT foundation consists of database, a database class, a programming class, and the systems analysis class. Those are those are the three. And and you have some flexibility, right? For programming, you can take Java or Python. For data management, you can take traditional relational data management with SQL, right? Um, or you can take data management for analytics, which includes NoSQL. OK, another topic um, uh, in addition to uh, traditional SQL. All right, and then everyone has to take systems analysis and project management. All right, so I want to talk about course waivers next. If you have an undergraduate degree in computer science or another technical discipline, right? And you've already taken programming as an undergraduate student and or you've already taken uh, data management as an undergraduate student, right? And you don't necessarily want to repeat that class again as part of your graduate degree studies. You have the ability to waive uh, either or both 
programming and data management. Okay, you cannot waive systems analysis and project management. Everyone has to take that class. When you waive an IT foundation class, you're able to substitute a higher level MIS elective in its place. So you're able to substitute any course with an MIS prefix in place of that waived course. So it doesn't reduce the number of courses you're required to take. Instead, it lets you choose an elective um, instead of the required core course listed here. All right. There are some rules about waivers. Um, one, the course has to be uh, within six years, so you have to have completed it uh, within uh, a six year time window. You have to have a B or better um, in it, right? And uh, you also have, it has to be taken as part of a, um, you know, a, a, it has to be taken at a university as part of a degree plan, as a part of a degree program. So, so certificate courses typically don't count um, for the waiver process. Uh, professional experience typically doesn't count uh, for the waiver process either. So, um, so anyway, the choice is yours. So if, say, for example, you've taken programming before and you, and you want to waive it, you can so apply for the waiver. If um, you don't want to waive the class, right, then uh, you can take it again or take it and, and, and just kind of brush up your skills and learn more about it. There's a lot of flexibility. For the business core, again, there's a lot of flexibility you're going to see here. And for business core classes, you have the ability to pick three courses uh, of your choosing from any of the areas listed on this page. So you have to pick from three different areas. That's the only rule, right? So um, whatever combination you end up with, three of the courses have to be from different business disciplines. So you could take one from marketing, one from accounting, and one from stats, right? That's three different disciplines. The, the big um, header at the top here, that represents the business area, the business function, the, the discipline, so to speak, for that area. And as part of your business core, you're going to choose from at least three different areas. And within an area, you have a choice, right? So maybe you're interested in marketing and you want to take the professional selling class because you're interested in being uh, a technical salesperson uh, or something along those lines, right? Or maybe you want to learn more about interactive and digital marketing. So you could take uh, this class and count it as a business core class, right? The choice is yours. Maybe you're interested in healthcare and information systems. Uh, you can choose this as your business core, right? HMGT 6320. Um, the, the business core courses that you see are courses that are um, typically part of a another degree plan, another degree program. So, for example, we have a master of science program in healthcare leadership and management. And this American Healthcare System class is a core class in that degree plan. So if you take that class, when you take that class, right, you'll be um, in the classroom with students who are a mix of students and, and many of them will be majoring in that degree rather than information systems. So IS as a discipline, right, is, is it's important to understand different business areas and different business functions and how they operate. And so that's what the business core provides. It provides you uh, a breadth of knowledge and exposure to, to, di to different business areas. But again, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what courses you choose to take. And then we have our elective courses, okay? The elective courses are split out into tracks or areas of specialization. So we have um, uh, seven tracks that we currently offer. And within each track, you're going to see, you know, six, seven or eight or, or maybe even a dozen uh, different courses you can choose from. So our enterprise systems track, right, has the following semester long courses, right? And you can see those listed here. The business intelligence and analytics track has the following semester long courses listed here. So each row represents a semester long course, right? And when you pick your elective courses, you can pick all six from a single track if you want. So maybe you love analytics and that's all you want to study. You could pick all six just from the analytics track, right? Or you could pick, you know, one course from each of the, you know, from six different tracks, right? Or, you know, maybe you pick 
uh, three from analytics and three from cybersecurity. Or maybe you go, you know, three from product management and three from analytics, right? Or three from product management and three from cybersecurity or, you know, two, two and two from three different tracks, right? The, the choice here is, is, is uh, really up to you. So um, we don't require you to complete a track. Um, the requirement is you have to have uh, at least four MIS courses uh, as part of your elective coursework and um, you need 18 credit hours or six courses total of elective coursework and and the you know the two additional um, can be additional MIS courses or they could be courses from another department another business area all right and so let's talk about um, your first semester and recommendations so for your first semester, if you plan to graduate in two years, so if you're a full time student, you plan to graduate in two years, I recommend taking three, three credit hour classes and professional development. All right. So um, first year students, first time, if you're going to take two years, I would take one business core, one IT foundation and one MIS elective or IT elective. All right. Um, in addition to those nine credits or three classes, right, we require anyone that does not have prior U.S. work experience to take MAS 6102 professional development. Professional development is a class that helps you um, navigate the U.S. job market. It helps you understand how the U.S. job market functions. It helps you uh, learn the process for finding your internship, your first internship. and and uh, finding full-time placement uh, when you are ready to graduate. This is a, a one credit hour class. This one credit does not count as part of your 36 credits, so it's in addition to the 36 credits uh, of coursework. Uh, we ask everyone to take this in their very first semester. We want you to start thinking about your internship and your job in your very first semester, all right? So that's, that's by design, right? We don't want you to wait. Uh, to you know, start thinking about your internship until later. Um, so as far as your business core choices go, right? So the three classes, a business core, IT foundation, and uh, an MIS elective. Many of our students, I'd say probably close to 90%, take some type of statistics as one of their business core. And I'd recommend taking that in your first semester. So if you're joining fall of 22, Right, I would take as a business core class um, either 6301 or 6359, as you see listed here. There's a, a really important point I need to make here, and and um, th this is something that comes up every once in a while, and uh, I want to make sure that I clearly communicate this this process and and I guess this restriction we have in place really, and. If you want to take advanced analytics courses or, or even just some of our basic analytics courses, right, you need to complete and take advanced stats for data science. All right, so let's say you want to take business analytics with R. That's a class I teach. It's Buon 6356 is the course number, right? As a prerequisite for advanced, I'm sorry, for business analytics with R, you must first take advanced stats for data science as either a prereq or a co-rec, all right? So you cannot take BA with R unless you first take or are taking concurrently advanced stats for data science, all right? So that sounds, sounds okay, sounds reasonable, but, but here's the kind of the big catch. It's not possible to take both stats classes and count them towards your degree. So, so you can only take one. You can only take either 6301 or 6359. You don't have the ability to take 6301 first and then 6359 next. All right. You can do that, but you, you have to pay three credit hours of extra tuition. One of the courses won't count towards your degree, but it, it's, it's just not advisable to take both. Um, no one wants to do that from the people I've spoken with. So your, your decision is, right, if you want to pursue analytics, advanced analytics, right, 
you're going to want to take advanced stats for data science in your first semester. All right. And that word advanced combined with stats kind of scares a lot of people sometimes um, because you could be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know stats or I've never never taken a stats class and and now you're asking me to take advanced stats and and this advanced stats class is, is designed for people that, that don't have prior stats backgrounds about prior stats background right so that's what i wanted to jump in and fun. say um i had i had this question a lot when they put that in i received information from the instructors for the course the first part of the course is going over the terminology, the terms, bringing you up to speed on what you need to know for the advanced class. So if you had, don't have prior stats experience, the instructors have said they do cover that in the first few weeks of the courses. Um, if you're also concerned, you can always go out and check a syllabus from a previous semester, look at the books that they're using, Go ahead and grab the book and look through it before class starts. But the instructors have said, don't don't let the advanced in the name scare you off. Yeah, no, and and that is that does scare some people off, right? And and just again, if you want to take analytics classes like BA with R, and there are several others that fall into this category, you're going to need to take advanced stats first. And the way you figure that out, right, is is you can, you know, I should just be able to mouse over um, a course and it's going to hopefully pull up the detail. I might have to click on it this time. So if I click on the course, um, it's going to provide me with the details about it. There we go. So I guess the mouse over did come up. It just took a little while. And, um, you know, I see a description of the course. So this is business analytics with R. And I see a list of the prerequisites or co-requisites, right? And so, Luan 6359, OPRE 6359 is a prereq or co-rec, meaning you have to complete it either before taking BA with R or you have to be enrolled in it as you are taking BA with R, all right? So you can, you know, further see down here, right? Uh, applied machine learning, um, you know, I put that in our advanced analytics grouping as well. Right, and you can see the prereqs listed here. So this one has a group of prereqs. So you have to take an analytics class like BA with R or BA with SAS. And then you also have to have advanced stats. All right, that's this OPRE 6359. So you can get to it all from our degree plan page. It, it's just, you know, something again that um, I, I really want to point out and emphasize because it's something that comes up every once in a while. We'll, you know, have someone come to us in, in their third semester saying, hey, I want to take applied machine learning and, and it's not letting me enroll. And, and, you know, the reason is they haven't taken advanced stats, but they they have taken um, our other stats class. And and anyway, they, they can't they can't end up taking applied machine learning. They have to pick something else instead. So, you know, a lot of our data classes, data management classes, so big data, for example, data warehousing, that's not going to require advanced stats. So here we see uh, big data, right? And you'll see advanced stats is not a prereq, only data management is a prereq or data management for analytics, right? Um, and so uh, so that's good news. Data warehousing is up here, right? You can see it, see its list of prereqs and doesn't have any. So, so that's good news there as well. So um, one business core, one IT foundation and one MIA selected for your uh, business. I'm sorry for your IT foundation class. It's all the way at the top. If you're brand new to the world of information systems and, and about 15% of our students are, are brand new and, and our program is set up such that those that are new to information systems and IT and management right can be successful. And so if you're brand new, I recommend taking data management as your first IT foundation class, either data management or data management for analytics, right? That's a really good foundation class to take. Um, a number of the other classes build on it. You'll get some programming exposure in, in that you're going to be writing SQL queries, right? And that programming will help you as you move into more complex programming in your Java or Python class. 
okay? So data management um, is uh, a course I recommend taking first uh, if you're new to the world of information systems. So one IT foundation, one business core, and again, stats is, is uh, the business core I recommend taking in your first semester. And then one MIS elective. And this MIS elective is going to depend, right, on what your interests are. So um, if you're interested in SAP and enterprise systems, you would take an SAP course. If cybersecurity is your thing, right, take cyber. If product management is your thing, digital product management, right, that's one of our newer tracks. Take digital product management, uh, either foundations or you know, I like Agile Project Management. That's one I teach as well. Um, we have a, you know, cloud computing track, a new cloud computing track, and, you know, maybe that's your interest area, right? Then I would take Foundations of Cloud Computing um, as your MIS elective, okay? So, so that's my advice for what classes to register for uh, in your first semester if you plan to complete the degree in two years. If you plan to complete it in 18 months, if you want to complete it on an accelerated basis, then um, my advice, you're going to take four three credit hour classes in your first semester along with that one credit hour professional development, right? And so um, that fourth class should be an additional uh, MIS elective, okay? So it'd be one business core, one IT foundation, and two MIS electives. Um, it, it's, I'll say, 65% or so take three, three credit hour classes their first semester, 35% take four. It, it just kind of depends, right? There's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you choose to do. Um, if you are able to waive an IT foundation class, uh, I would suggest replacing it with an MIS elective. So if you're waiving an IT foundation class, you're going to take nine credits. If you want to take nine credits, it would be one business core, two MIS electives. If you're taking 12 credits, it's going to be 12 credits plus professional development, right? It's one business core plus three MIS electives, okay? So you can kind of figure that out from there. And then, you know, again, there's there's a lot of flexibility and, and the world of MIS is big, it's broad, it, it's, it's uh, you know, encompasses a lot of different areas. So, so you have um, you know, the flexibility to pick and choose the path that helps you best meet your needs. Um, so the this courses themselves, and uh, we have a, a website called Coursebook, right? And so on Coursebook, you can, you can search Coursebook to see a list of classes that we offer by semester. And it, it basically is, is extracting uh, information from Orion, which is our official system of record. So, so this data is, is read only. Um, you can't actually register for courses from this particular uh, website, but it, it's kind of a quick and easy way to, um, you know, to see what's available, to see what's out there. And so Coursebook is going to have a list of all the classes we're offering for in this case, I selected fall of 22. Um, it has the timing of the class and the instructor listed. So uh, we see this class 6308 is taught by Professor Tim Stevens on Mondays from 1 to 345 in room JSOM 1.107. All right, that one's currently full. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but again, if you're admitted to the program, and you've accepted your admission. You actually have the ability to, to enroll in classes now. You don't need to wait. And, and I'd encourage you to do so. All right. And then, you know, so on and so forth down the list. I can, you know, I can click on a course to get some additional detail about it. I have the tabbed interface across the top. I see the course description. If I want to look at and learn more about the instructor, right, I can see the bio and the resume of, of in this case, Professor Stevens. Um, and, you know, I can see his experience and, and what he's, you know, worked on and what he's done over his career and what he's teaching and what he's doing now. All right. Our faculty, in my opinion, are superstars, right? And, and I think you'll see that as you move through the program. Every one of our faculty has extensive experience and is a leader in their field. 
So you can't go wrong. Whoever you're taking a class from is, is going to do a great job. Okay. And, and the background and the experience is very, very different. Yeah, Donna, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I have a lot of students saying I didn't get the professor I wanted. Just because one of your friends really loved a professor may not mean that you would love that same professor. And as Professor Thuin just said, all of our instructors have experience. They are all excellent. So don't focus necessarily on I have to have this instructor. Try out a different instructor that your friends didn't take. You may find that you like them better. So don't panic that you're not getting the instructor you want. Um, chances are you'll get a chance to take another course from them maybe later on down the line. Yeah, exactly. OK. Yeah, thank Good point, Donna. Really good point. And you know, sometimes you'll see a class that has no meeting location. Um, that means it's an online class. We, we have a number of classes that we offer asynchronously online. And what that means is the lectures are recorded and students are able to watch the recorded lectures anytime over the course of, let's say, a week and then complete some work, coursework um, that goes along with that recorded lecture each and every week. So, you know, the zero W one suffix. So we have the prefix, which is the uh, in this case, MIS, which is the department or area of the course or the program of the course, followed by the number, the course number 6319, followed by the suffix. And, and the suffix is the section number. If you see W in that section number, that means it's asynchronous online and um, it, it is a recorded lecture. Um, the, the asynchronous online has uh, an additional fee that goes along with it. I believe it's $100 per credit hour. That's to cover the production cost of actually producing in the, the recordings themselves. And if you are an international student on an F1 visa, um, you are limited uh, with respect to the number of online, asynchronous online classes you can take. Um, so uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, you have to take at least one traditional face-to-face -face class uh, along with your other online classes if you choose to take online classes. You know, online classes, they're not required. You don't have to take your classes online, all right? This is, again, it's flexible. We're flexible. If you want to take a class online, you can. And, you know, many of our students who are working on an internship um, choose to take a class online um, while they're working on their internship asynchronously online. But if you want to take every class in person, face-to-face, -face, on campus, you can do that, all right? The choice is, is up to you. And uh, let's see, other thoughts about registration. Um, we, we are adding to the register to, to the list of available courses. So if you see a course that's full right now, um, we're in the process of adding additional sections, adding additional capacity. Um, we have a number of, of uh, new faculty that will be joining us in the fall. And, and once new faculty are, are brought on board, the schedule will be updated to reflect the courses they're teaching as well. All right. So Ranjitha, I know you're on the call with us. Do you have any gen general advice about uh, course registration, course selection in your first semester? Uh, yeah, I would love to give uh, some advice. So what I did, was I planned for entire duration of my graduation. So in that way, you will know uh, the courses which you are interested in and say if one course is already full, you'll not be in a panic mode where you say that I had to take this course for this semester and I don't have that offered in this semester. So I will have a backup plan to take some other course and I can take the offer which I wanted to take in the next semester. So that would be one like you can plan your entire graduation um, courses and you will have better options in that. And as Professor Twain and Professor Dona said, uh, all of our faculty members are like extremely talented. And uh, I've seen like uh, most of the courses which I've taken all are having real data sample uh, data sets which I work on. So it helps me to actually work on my uh, internship data as well. So 
whatever the professors teach, they take the examples of real time uh, scenarios. So I would say it doesn't matter with the professor, so you can concentrate on choosing the subjects which you would like it. So the other advice I was uh, thinking about is uh, <clears throat> when you are choosing a, a course, like you will have a decision to make, like I wanted to become a data analyst or I wanted to become a data engineer. So you can go on LinkedIn or any other job portals online and see the job description on like what they are exactly looking for. So uh, that is how I, I did like I am interning as a data engineer. So I choose the subjects which help me to boost as a um, data engineer rather than choosing which are subjects which are not of kind of my interest. So that would be my other advice while choosing the uh, courses which would be really helpful for your job search and your internship. So that's from my excellent. Yeah, thank you, Ranjitha. Great advice. Thank you very much. And and uh, so Ranjitha was, you know, two years ago. She's exactly where you are, right? Exactly where you are today. And and so she's been through this, and and that's uh, very good advice to follow. Um, I've seen quite a few questions questions come in and I'm going to try and answer a few of the questions. I know Donna and, and others have been, uh, Ranjitha, I know you've been answering the questions as well, but I uh, just want to you know, pick out a few and highlight them because several others might have the same question and may not be noticing them. So uh, I saw one, can you complete the degree entirely online? And the answer there is yes. That's uh, Musa, you can complete the entire degree online. So you can complete, you know, all 36 credit hours of required coursework entirely online without ever setting foot on campus if you want to, right? Or you can complete the entire degree entirely face-to-face, -face, right? With nothing but um, uh, class-based, classroom-based courses, right? The choice the choice is up to you. It's a mix. It's a hybrid. We, we don't distinguish or, or, or you know, um, group students in one or the other. You know, you are an ITM student, you get to decide which courses you want to take. Again, if you're an F1 student, there are certain rules about your visa that you must follow. So just be aware of that as well. Um, and so the professional development course, yes, it is only offered in person so far. Um, so once COVID ended uh, and we went, went back uh, full time face to face, professional development is only back in person. Um, that is true. And uh, I, I saw a question about certificates and I did yeah, want to talk mention. about that. There we go. I can bring up the link. And I also saw a couple questions about jobs. So internships and full time job placement. And, and I, I want to make sure I touch on those topics as well, because obviously that's, you know, that's a big reason why you're here and, and why, why you're interested in joining the program, right? OK, so certificates, this link was posted to the chat window and we have um, five different certificates. Uh, actually, they're, they're more than five, right? So um, we have seven different cer certificate options, I'll call them. OK, and the certificates are, are kind of one of two types, one of two categories. Um, I'll start with the the. Um, it's the exception first. So we have two certifications that exist outside of traditional courses and coursework. And, and so these are ITIL, ITIL 4 Foundation Certificate and the SAP TERP 10 or TS 410 certification. So the way the ITIL certification works is there is um, a weekend class that you sign up for. It, you don't get course credit, so it doesn't count towards your 36 credit hours, but it is an instructor led class and um, you would study for, you know, two eight hour days or so. And at the end of that period of time, you would sit for and take the, in this case, the ITIL 4 certification exam. All right. There is a separate fee for the ITIL 4 certification exam. Um, you can click on it and see exactly what it is, uh, drill down and get the details. The fee, so it is a 12 hour session, so I, I think it's uh, split over two days. And you can see the details, so 9 to 3, uh, May 28, May 29. 
It's 450 per student. Registration is still open. The 450 does include, right? It includes the following: the instructor. Uh, so the fee for the instructor it includes two sample tests, um, one certification exam voucher. So you don't have to pay extra to actually take the certification exam and a complimentary voucher for remote proctoring. So the idea is you study for those two days, the end of the two days, you take the exam, you get certified. All right. The TERP 10 is a little more intensive. It's more involved. So it's an instructor wet led two week course. So nine days of training. Right. So Monday through Friday, uh, you know, starting May 9th and then the following Monday through Friday, the week after that. And then on the final day of, of the two weeks, you would sit for and take the SAP TERP 10 certification exam. Um, you know, we can see the cost listed here, 1151. Again, you know, the money goes towards the instructor. You have a couple of instructors that are teaching it. And then also uh, the exam itself. So, so these are what I'll, what I'll call certifications that kind of exist outside of our, our traditional uh, classroom based courses. The other five that you see listed here, um, there, there's no additional fee required for the five certificates you see listed here. OK, and so um, the way these certificates work is there are groups of classes. Uh, that we've identified as, you know, constituting a particular knowledge base in an area. And and if you complete either three or four classes, it depends on the certificate, right? Then you get certified in that area. So we have a certificate in business intelligence and data mining, right? And the way this one works is if you take the following courses, stats, BA with SAS or BA with R, right? Advanced BA with stats or advanced BA with R and business data warehousing, then you will earn the certificate, right? And this is in this case, this is a UT Dallas certificate. You would get um, a notation on your transcript that says you earned the certificate in business intelligence and data mining. You'll notice the courses listed here are the same exact courses that you take as part of your degree. All right, so so you don't have to take courses twice. Um, you literally can just if you pick a certain set of courses. That those courses count both towards your degree and towards your certificate or this certificate in this case. All right. And you know the same we have applied machine learning, right? I think this is four courses. So advanced stats be able with our um, applied machine learning and uh, natural language processing. So, you know, you can stack certificates. So you could take and earn both BI and data mining and applied machine learning, right? If you wanted to, right? And all of those courses, again, would also count towards your, uh, your, your 36 credit hours of your ITM degree. The cybersecurity, right? We see the foundation or the fundamentals course. And then you have different tracks along with it. Right, so for the most part, um, I thought we had one certificate that was only three courses, but so far, I think it's this one. Yeah, so the enterprise system cert is three courses. Most are, th are four, so so far it depends, right? So for enterprise systems, if you take the foundation class and any two of the following, then you, you know, get certified in SAP, all right? So that's our certificates. That's the way they work. There is a kind of a slightly separate process that you need to follow um, in order to apply for a certificate. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, and and it, it's really just just and we have a flow chart for it, believe it or not. It, it, it's um, so just make sure you follow this and be aware of this, right? So. At some point prior to your graduating semester, you need to apply to the certificate program. All right. And ideally, you want to do that as soon as possible, as soon as you know you're going to do it. And you can see that's listed here. All right. So let's talk about job placement and internships, because I know that's always a, a topic of interest for everyone. 
right? And so if you go to both our internship tab and our career tab, it's going to have a lot of details. I'm actually going to start with our career tab because I like talking about this quite a bit, right? So when our students graduate um, and, and students join the ITM program because, you know, they're looking to advance their career and or, you know, get a good job, get a great job, really. And, and um, we keep track of and track very carefully metrics around job placement and internship placement, okay? So every graduating class, we, we track um, how many were placed in a full-time position, and we also track salary data. So this most recent graduating class that we have data for is spring of 21. Again, this is more or less in the middle of the pandemic, right? Um, we had 246 students graduate. Their average salary was $86,200, okay? Highest salary package, 200,000. We had a couple students um, uh, fall into that category. And, uh, you know, 79% were placed within three months, all right? So almost 80% of the 246 students had a full-time job in their field within 90 days of graduation, all right? Um, so that, that's, that's, a, that's good news, right? I, I think it's exciting news, right? And, and you can see, you know, some of the job titles, some of the job roles, you know, data analyst, data engineer, data scientist, business analyst, big data engineer. It's often a mix of, you know, data um, analyst, um, engineer uh, in many of our job titles. Uh, we can see, you know, the specific employers hiring our students, Goldman Sachs, Amazon, AWS, CBS Health. Um, Ernst & Young, SAP, so on and so forth. Um, you want to see, really see the detail. You, you can get the detail going back almost 15 years. And, you know, in this case, every row represents uh, a graduate, an MSITM alum, their employer, and their job title. Obviously, doesn't have the salary data because that would violate their privacy. Uh, on the individual level, we report salary data in the aggregate as an average. So 7-Eleven, Accord Solutions, right? And we see the job titles go along with them. Amazon Web Services. So you're going to see about 200 rows listed here, right? EY, Facebook, Goldman Sachs. We had um, four graduates go work for, for Goldman Sachs. Uh, John Deere, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, Optimal Solutions, SAP, uh, TCS, right? And the list goes on and on and on. It's an impressive list, right? And has all our job titles to, that goes along with it. This is our this is our history, right? And I, I think this is important for for you to look at and for you to think about as as you move forward, right? Um, good schools, good programs aren't shy about measuring themselves and reporting how they do. And, and that's, that's one thing we do as well. And I think that helps set, set us apart. Um, we keep track and report on our job placement, right? And so you can see every semester going back all the way to 2012. So about 10 years of history here, right? We can see our job placement rate. Um, it was, you know, up in the 90s, it's hovers around 80%, right? Give or take goes up and down a little bit. We, we kind of changed a little bit how we reported information um more recently but but anyway it, it's it it's good data right it, it's showing the effectiveness of the program and and the ability of our program to to help students get placed in good paying jobs right so um you know i've been in my role for uh close to 15 years and and you know, this is something that I keep track of very carefully. Uh, much of what we do in the program itself, in terms of courses and requirements, is designed to help you get that full-time job and a good full-time job with a high-paying salary when you graduate. All right. So internships, um, same same story, right? We we keep track of that very carefully. We report on it. We make the data available. Um, we show everyone, uh, you know, exactly what and where our students are, what our students are doing and where they're working. So past academic year, we had 381 internships with 264 employers. 
you know, the average salary has been going up here for our interns. It's uh, $27 an hour. I think I saw something closer to $29 an hour for the most recent semester. Um, so that will be, I guess, this semester spring. And then you can see the, the data listed here, the highest wage uh, in terms of dollars also. And then, um, you know, some testimonials. And, you know, if you want to drill down and get the detail, you can, right? So these are now you know, internship positions rather than uh, full-time placements. Um, and you can see what's listed here also. So overall, you know, these these salaries, right? And, and you can think of um, an internship is 40 hours a week. Most commonly, it's 40 hours a week. And most commonly, it's, you know, 12, 13 weeks long in duration. So you can kind of do the math on that and start to see that, hey, this is going to, you know, help pay for some of your college, college experience, right? So it, it's a good thing. And and you are able to work on multiple internships as part of your degree plan as well. So we are, we're kind of getting close to our time. Um, and let me just see if there are some some questions in the chat window uh, that, that I want to try and answer and talk about a little bit more. So Krishna, I see you have a question here. Um, can you work in non-Dallas companies doing part-time um, so the, the short answer to that, if you're talking about an internship, it would need to be full-time enrollment. Given that you have enrollment things, it would need to be a full-time position, in which case you would be qualified for reduced enrollment for that particular semester. Um, full time is considered anything over 20 hours for at least 11 weeks. So if you're only if you're working 21 hours, most people would consider that part time for purposes of your internship and CPT that is considered full time. But you cannot if a company outside of Dallas offers you a job working 10 hours a week during a fall or spring semester, you will not be able to accept that position because you do need to be enrolled in face-to-face -face classes on campus. Now, over the summer, you can do that because you're not required to take courses over the summer. Um, if you have additional questions in that area, feel free to send me an email and I might be able to give you a better explanation at that point in time. But work, working part-time as an international student, um, Generally, it, it in order to get reduced enrollment, it has to be full time. Yeah, thank you, Donna. That that's that's a good question, and and that was a a good answer, right? So so thank you very much. Um, you know, are students allowed to work as software developers, right? And the answer there is yes, right? ITM grads, are you eligible to do that? And right here, right, you can see this. We had six, right, six of our, this is May 21 grads, go work for AWS as software development engineers, right? And and so, you know, I, I kind of think the question is coming, right, because it may be a computer science or some people perceive it to be computer science focused, but there's, there's quite a bit of overlap between ITM and, you know, different courses in computer science. So the short answer is yes. Yeah, so Srinivas, right? So good good question here um, about the uh, machine learning certificate. And you can take applied natural language processing as one of your free electives, okay? So everybody gets up to two six credit hours of free electives as part of your degree program. So you can certainly complete the certificate as part of the degree without taking any additional courses. Yeah, so Rohit, scholarship decisions. We did have a, a batch that went out fairly recently and um, that was going, that was our, that was a big batch, right? So, so, so um, you know, my understanding is there may be just a couple of more uh, coming out later, but you you should have been notified, right, with a yes or a no. 
um, sometime this past week. So if the answer was no, then I, you know, or yes, right, then you, you kind of take that as, as your answer. So class size, um, that's a good question as well. So Sadesh, what's our class size, incoming class size? And we do keep track and have our demographics data listed or demographic data listed as well. Um, that's left over from internships. So we're, we're expecting about 400 new students this fall. Uh, so that's bigger than some programs. I, I think the size of our program is a big advantage for us. Uh, we're able to offer a larger number of elective courses than most schools. Um, we have both depth and breadth of course offerings, right? So when you look at our curriculum and, and you look at the elect, we have so many elective courses, it's unbelievable, right? It, it's, and, and we're able to offer the electives, we're able to offer um, so many because we have um, you know, a, a larger intake and a, a larger number of students in the program as well. So, uh, question about holds, right? So you can remove your holds prior to coming to UTD in August, right? So, um, you can get rid of all of them and start registering for classes. And I would encourage you to do so. And, and so, um, you know, there are some holds that will put on, put back in place um, so that, you know, you may not be able to register the second semester or they, they get put in place once you actually arrive on campus. So one is a, um, I think a TB hold, right? We want to see a negative TB test. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes there's a hold about uh, transcripts or transcripts not being um, uh, final transcripts not being available either. And, and we talked, we spent quite a bit of time talking about holds as well in the first uh, five or 10 minutes uh, of the session today. So this session is being recorded and, and so you will have access to this session. You'll have a link that you'll receive and uh, you can go back and watch it and, and um, you know, if you have any uh, additional questions about it. So we are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right at time here, over time a little bit by eight minutes or so. So um, I'm gonna wrap things up and uh, I'm just gonna ask, I guess, Donna, Ranjitha, I know you've been monitoring the, the questions, the chat window questions, probably a lot closer than I have. Um, do you have any um, anything you, else you'd like to point out and or any final thoughts you'd like to share? Um, Ranjitha had to jump off. She had to get to class. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important. Basically, if you have not received a scholarship decision yet, um, my understanding is those letters should be going out shortly. So just be patient. Um, you can check your status online to see if anything's changed there. Other other questions? Um, I would really suggest I'm posting the links again to our various web pages. Most of your questions are answered there. So check the links, go to the web pages, look for the information. If you don't find it on our web pages, then yeah, feel free to send me an email. I've posted my email a couple of times. So, and I will post that again as well. But really, the web pages have a ton of information. And if you need clarification on anything, um, I'm always here, so feel free to reach out. Posting my email address again. Yeah, so Kathy, I see your hand is up. We'll take maybe one question to wrap things up. So Kathy, do you have a question? Yes, Professor. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, I wanted to know what are the criteria that you look into uh, when uh, giving scholarship to second year students? <laughs> Your students, okay. Yes. So we have several types of scholarships available. Uh, the two biggest are Dean's Excellence and Dean's Impact Scholarships for second year students. Uh, Dean's Excellence is given primarily to students who um, have performed exceptionally well in the classroom. So it means they have a 4.0 GPA. Um, 
The Dean's Impact Scholarship is awarded to students who make a significant contribution to the school above and beyond you know, what happens on a regular basis. And those those are the biggest two. Those are the ones that have the most money behind them. Um, you know, I will say in the second year, uh, most of our students are working on internships as well. So that that's another another thing to consider. But that, that's a good question. So so thank you for asking. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just wrap things up here. So uh, so thank you for your time this morning, this afternoon, this evening, where you wherever you happen to be. And um, I hope you've found this information session useful and helpful. If you have more information or additional questions, just let us know and uh, we'll be happy to uh, to answer them. Uh, Donna will uh, post a uh, a link and and uh, a way to connect with us in the chat window. Um, you know, I'm excited about the prospects of, that you have for your future, right? We have a, a top program in the country. U.S. News has ranked us number 12 in the country, um, and uh, I'm, I'm just very optimistic and excited in general about the future. So uh, look forward to, to, you know, eventually meeting you in person on campus in the fall and, um, you know, hope you have a good rest of the day and uh, and thanks a lot again for everything.